Um, quite a lot of faces I don't recognise, which is, which is really good. Can I just ask who um, is here at this conference for the first time? Wow, amazing. Um, so I don't have to worry about the fact that, uh, you know, if, if three quarters of you had heard me speak uh, last year, um, you might be worrying about, um, you know, whether this was just going to be the same, the same talk again. It, it is, it, the talk has moved on a long way um, since last year, but there is also some stuff in common. What you may or may not know um, is that about a year and a half ago, around New Year um, 2013, I wrote a blog post called Introducing Kanban Through Its Values. I'd abstracted a value system from the principles and practices of Kanban. We're going to look at that in a moment. And really everything I've done since has been based on that. I'm writing a book and you'll, 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 you'll see a bit about that in a minute as well. Um, but welcome, uh, welcome to the conference, welcome to the Kanban track. And I'll mention some of the other uh, Kanban talks we've got today um, over the course of my talk. So, I'm simply asking a question of you. Um, perhaps this question is, you know, why are we here? Why are we here at this conference? Um, what are you looking uh, from this conference? Uh, what are you looking from Kanban? What are you looking from the Kanban method? What do you expect it to, to give you? Um, if you're new to Kanban, your curiosity must have been um, you know, aroused by something, some benefit that you thought you might, you might get from it. Um, if you've been using Kanban for a while, you'll be aware of some of the benefits you are receiving from it. Now, the benefits you can receive, you know, there are quite a number of them. And um, actually, let's have a go. Just shout out in just sort of one or two words, you know, what are some of the benefits that you're looking for um, in Kanban? I beg your pardon? Faster delivery, that's a good one. Transparency, I heard. Visibility, another very similar thing, yes? Sustainability. Sustainability. You see, you've seen the talk. Um, uh, less context switching. Less context switching. Yep, those, those are all good answers. Um, and those, those are all answers that mean something to you, and that's good. Um, now, I'm going to switch the context a bit. Now, this may be representative of your environment, it may not. So, here is a pretty large team. Um, this, is their, this team is working on an $11 million project. Um, that's our friend uh, Dan Vacanti on the left there. Behind him is about a million dollars worth of work on the, written on the board. Oh, we're going to look at that board in a minute. So what do you think these guys want from Kanban? Sorry. Daily priorities, that's a good one. Have one more. Got a million dollars worth of work, work done, yes. I mean, some, some sign that they're winning, perhaps. Um, you know, you're working on something that takes, it takes a few months. You know, you want some feedback that think things are moving forward. Right, so we're going to have a quick, a quick go at uh, an exercise called the, the, the Kanban Values Exercise. Now, this is the super quick version. We're going to spend just a couple of minutes on it. Um, you can download a version of it that you can spend something like 45 minutes um, with your teams doing. And I've seen some really fruitful... Um, Discussions come out of that. I know there are people in this room that have done it, that have done it with other groups, and have reported back that they found it really helpful. Um, so we we'll take the foundational principles of Kanban. Quick show of hands again. Who's seen these before? You might have. So about a third of you. Okay. You might have seen three. You might have seen four. We, we've got the full full set here. So we're going to work from the bottom, with encourage acts of leadership and so on, working our way up. I'm going to choose from that list of nine values at the bottom, the, the, the value that goes to that principle. So out of customer focus, agreement, collaboration, flow, leadership, transparency, understanding, respect, and balance. Which one do you think goes with encourage acts of leadership at all levels of, of your organization? You can shout it out. So I'll read through them again. Can you, can you all see the, uh, the, the, the values at the bottom of the screen? Some of you can't. Okay, customer focus, agreement, collaboration, flow, leadership, transparent, transparency, understanding, respect, and balance. So which one of those nine values goes with encourage acts of leadership at all levels in your organization? Leadership, yes. Right, so we're not, we're not, we're not evil, this isn't, these aren't trick questions, let's try another one. Um, it, respect, right, initially respect existing roles, responsibilities and job titles, and that's actually a really great piece of change management advice, um, but wrapped up in it is a really important value, respect, or respect for people, as, 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 as the lead people would say. Agree to pursue evolutionary change. This is a slightly harder one. Um, 
again, out of customer focus, agreement, collaboration, flow, transparency, understanding, and balance. Those are the ones we've got left. Agreement we have at the back. And the last one, now this is probably the hardest, the most subtle of these four, and um, starts with what you do now. Understanding, who said that? Brilliant, yes, that is, that is my answer. Um, we have, I have, I've seen quite a few other answers to that one, and they're all, they're all good answers. Um, understanding is my answer. So understanding, agreement, respect, and leadership. So those are four values that I read into the foundational principles of the Kanban method. Now we're going to do this again with the practices, and again we're going to work from bottom to top, just because it's easier that way. Um, now one thing that makes this harder is that one of the values appears three times. So I can't when we when we when we find them, we can't just cross them off straight away until we've worked out which is the one that appears more than once. Um, so anyway, we'll start at the bottom. Improve collaboratively, evolve experimentally. I've heard balance and collaboration. The answer is collaboration. Again, the clues and the words. <laughs> Improve collaboratively, collaboration. Right, now, uh, reasonably subtle, but not too hard. Implement feedback loops. Transparency, good answer. Make policies explicit. Transparency again. Right, so transparency is the one that appears more than once, it appears three times. Where do we think transparency appears? How to visualise, limit work in progress, and manage flow. Visualise, that's pretty straightforward. Right, um, we'll do the one with two in them next. Manage flow, there's an easy one and a hard one. What's the easy one? Flow. Good. Right, the harder one. You've got the choice between customer focus and balance for manage flow. I'm hearing both answers. Right, the answer, the answer, and you've got the choice of two. And balance actually goes to limit, limit work in progress. Customer focus goes with flow, because it's flow to something, to the customer. And we'll actually see later in the talk that that's actually really, really important. Balance goes with limited, limit work in progress. And we'll have a little bit of an understanding of why those two things go together in a moment. So, just really just to summarise, um, of those nine, and those of you that can see the nine written at the bottom, it'll be easier. You'll see them again through the course of the presentation. Um, quite useful exercise, actually, and this is something, again, you can do with your teams. Which three out of those nine resonate with you the most strongly, personally, and individually and as a team, can you agree which three might make the most difference in your current organisational context? So I'll just give you a moment to look at those again. As I said, you can download the full version of the exercise, and um, these slides will be published as well in due course. Um, and I'll move on. Oh, they'll, oh, they'll be on Twitter, first of all. They'll probably end up on a slide share. Right, so nine values, three agendas. That's, that's the real structure of the talk. Um, the, so the nine values, I've, I've arranged in groups of three. I like threes a lot, so three, lots of three here. Um, we're going to start with sustainability, transparency, balance, and collaboration, and these values really help to describe what a lot of people understand uh, Kanban to, to be about. We'll see that it's actually about a, a lot more than these things, um, but these are still very important. So we're back to transparency, um, balance and collaboration, uh, and we're gonna use this team here as an example. I said there was 11, they're working on an $11 million project, um, a multiple month project, a project big enough and important enough um, that they hired a lot of extra staff uh, to, to man the project um, in sufficiently to the extent that it actually you know, moved the contract rates in the, in the area that this, this project was happening in, in Seattle. Um, here's their board. Now, if you know that there's a million dollars worth of work on the board, I think this actually looks pretty organized. This doesn't look like a team that is panicking. Um, I think this is nice. And we're just gonna focus down in this corner here and think about the decisions that the person uh, who's working on that piece of work can make and what choices are available to them. Um, they can carry on where they are working on that piece of work uh, for as long as they want to or for as long as seems sensible. Um, they can follow the work to the right. They can move with the work to do the next activity in, in the workflow. Um, or they might be handing that piece of work over to, to another person. I happen to know from looking at the design of this board that it's much more likely they would follow the work um, than, than hand it over to somebody else. So that's already a sign that they have a nice, smooth process here. 
Um, I've seen some board designs where you can't tell um, whether people are functionally organised, that people work only within one activity, development, testing, analysis, whatever it might be, or whether people follow the work from, from start to finish. Um, I've worked in teams that do both and have had very similar designs of boards. Well, what about the board is um, the, there's some names written down on the, in, in, in here, so we know, in fact there's a particular team, it's the UI guys here, um, and, and I happen to know from, from talking to uh, people about this project that the, the people here actually sometimes need to move around, um, move around the board. But anyway, they can move to the right, to your right, uh, with the work, um, or they might help other people who are close to them doing similar things with similar kinds of work. Um, they might um, help people across those other swim lanes, so you know, kind of move from one team to another. That might be a viable option for them to do. They might, as I said, the work is moving from, from start to finish within the team. There may be a lot of work still um, left in, in different states of completion that this person might be able to make a useful contribution to. So that's a good choice. I mentioned that they, they, these teams are, you know, they have a particular expertise. Now, sometimes you want people with a particular expertise to be looking at what's coming. You know, uh, this is the UI team. Is there, pieces of, is there a piece of work in the backlog that the UI team should be particularly concerned about? Um, you know, so he might, he might be looking there. So lots of decisions. Um, a, a good range of choices, a good a set of opportunities of work to be done, but not, not an overwhelming uh, amount. Um, so this is, this is a sign of a, of a well-organised system, uh, just the right amount of work for the people involved, the people available to do the work. There's a good balance, this is where balance comes in, a balance between the number of people available to do the work and the amount of work. A sensible number of choices and they can make choices that the rest of the team will understand. You don't want, you don't want pe team members to be surprising each other all the time by you know, moving over here and then moving over there and there to be no you know, rationale behind those decisions. People want, people want a certain degree of predictability from their teammates. It just makes things, things work together better as a team. So that's the shared expectations. And the other thing is the feedback. As I said, when, when this piece of work has finished that current activity, it's going to move to the right. We can see, we can see it move. We're going to see, it, in the end, $11 million worth of work move from the, you know, the, the, the top left-hand side of the board over, over to the right. You know, we, we know that we're winning. Um, and that's very important when you're working on something that's going to take, uh, take a period of time. Even for things that don't take very long, it's good to have a sign that you're winning. But there's more. One thing I didn't mention is that they, another very valid choice is to look not just at the work on the board, but at the design of the board itself. Um, now, you may have heard, heard it said that improvement is a team sport. This is definitely not something you want to do on your own. It's something you want to involve people in. Um, and this is actually where the collaboration value comes from. It's a really high leverage thing to be doing. You know, it takes only moments to rub out a line on a Kanban board. It doesn't take long, or, or an electronic system. You know, a few clicks of the mouse and you've rearranged your board. You have rearranged your understanding of how things should work in a few moments, and that's really, really powerful. So that's the, that's the basis of the collaboration value. Um, but there are quite a lot of myths around collaboration. I mean, um, you know, I could jokingly say some of these people are smiling, so they must be, collabor they must be a collaborative team. You know, we have this sense of a you know, happy, well-functioning collaborative team. Um, I'd like to be a bit more specific about what collaboration means. And I got some, some well-known examples. Um, we recognize the guys on the left. So Lennon and McCartney. Um, guys on the right, this is a bit harder. Watson and Crick. So this is the model of uh, DNA um, in, in, in the back of the picture. So what we've got here are creative relationships, problem-solving relationships, call them what you like. Um, but the, the, the sum of the two parts seem to be somehow greater than the... Um, you know, the whole is greater than the, than the individuals. They achieve things um, through their relationship, through their collaboration, that they probably wouldn't have been able to achieve on their own. And that's something that organisations really need. Um, I'm not exaggerating when I say that that's actually why organisations actually exist. Um, if you know much about economics, you'll understand this, this, this concept, the theory of the firm. It's all about why, why do firms exist? And they exist um, because we can do things together much more um, efficiently, effectively, 
than we can do on our own. Some specific examples of improvement that are focused on collaboration. Um, so the first picture on the left, um, you know, we might have some high, highly collaborative uh, working between people, then something much less collaborative, you know, chucking things over the fence um, before we move into collaboration again. A classic example of this is the code review. Um, now, for me as a development manager, code review used to drive me nuts. Um, you know, we'd have people working hard on their, on their development, on their coding, and then submit a piece of code for review, and it would sit in someone's inbox for days, sometimes even weeks. And the, you know, the senior developer whose job was to review it um, would say, oh, it's much more efficient if I batch these things up. You know, I'll get to it when I'm ready. And then those several days or several weeks later, um, the reviewer would have bad news for the developer. You know, actually, this code isn't really good enough. And, and the developer's got to remember where he was all that time ago rework the code, submit it again, and so on. This is a really, really wasteful way of working. Now, I think many of us have discovered since those, those days things like pair programming, uh, highly collaborative, where the review and the coding is actually happening all the time between two people. Um, but even without going that far, um, just saying to the two people involved, you know, saying to the reviewer, you're responsible, responsible for the smooth delivery of this code, um, you know, Simple tweaks like that to people's expectations of behavior have made a massive difference uh, for me in terms of how long things take, the speed of turnaround of change. Um, you know, when you're surprised by things in a process, that's usually a sign that collaboration isn't working well enough. And, and as a manager, I've learned uh, to dig into those and to, to understand why the collaboration isn't effective enough. Collaboration may be as simple as the fact that there may be people that work in islands that, uh, you know, they don't have a chance to work collaboratively with other people. Not to say that we should force people to be collaborating all the time, but perhaps we're denying opportunities to people. And this last one, you know, when we do solve a problem as a team, you know, it's a good thing. You know, we celebrate, you know, we're, we're kind of brought closer together um, by solving problems together, which is 99% a good thing. Um, you know, it has some downsides as well. You know, teams can get too close. Um, they, can, they, can, they can become islands relative to other teams. They can protect information. Uh, you get them and us, you know, competitive behavior, all these other things. Um, so there is an extent to which collaboration doesn't scale, or at least can be a barrier to scale. Um, and we're going to address some of those things in a, in a moment. So this is sustainability, uh, and I think it's, I'm, it's fair in saying this is what a lot of you understand that Kanban is about, making your work visible, limiting your work in progress, uh, collaboratively improving the process, and, all, and, and so on. I would say it's about self-organizing teams learning to make better decisions, because the good choices, the good choices are available to, all the t all, to them all the time, and if it seems like good choices aren't available to them, then there's a reason to change the process. I have a hand up at the back, and I will, I will take questions if it's quick. So, yes, very quickly, I mean, don't spend too much time. Um, does it mean the same thing as sustainable pace? I was certainly inspired by the phrase sustainable pace. There's an echo of the Agile Manifesto in the choice of that word. Um, Eric over here, uh, hand up, Eric. Um, it's going to be speaking about sustainability in, in the next talk, actually, and um, you'll hear a lot more about this. And I think um, we're going to hear a little bit of the same sort of ideas um, with a different spin from Russell Healy as well um, in his talk. Right, so um, service orientation, that's the next one. Customer focus, flow, and leadership. Now, I, I said that collaboration you know, brings people together, but sometimes you need to actually get people out of themselves, get teams out of themselves and actually focus on something that's outside the team, through the team, beyond the team, and so on. That's a motivating thing, uh, but, it's, but it's really important when you're wanting to make an organization um, work more effectively. And here we have the Kanban lens. That's due to David, who's just leaving the room. Um, and the Kanban lens is a way to view what you do now. Um, and it just says three things. Creative work is service-oriented. You know, what we do is for somebody, generally. You know, we're helping people meet needs. We might be helping people to meet other people's needs and so on. There can be sort of cascades of, of, of service. Um, service delivery involves workflow. You know, we're often dependent on other people. We do something, then something for something else before we can give it to, to a third person and so on. So some sense of workflow. 
And the critical thing for creative knowledge work, which is what most of us here are engaged in, workflow involves a series of knowledge discovery activities. It's amazing, actually, how little we know about the work when we start. Um, for many of us, um, I'm very, I'm the, I'm the kind, when I do development, which I don't do so much these days, but I, I, you know, it's not that long ago, I'm quite used to taking just a post-its notes worth of information when I start. You know, it's just a sentence that prompts you know, a conversation with a customer, for example, um, to use a sort of XP type, type language. Um, I'm very comfortable with that. You know, there's a lot to be discovered when you're given only a few words as the, as the basis of a requirement. And that's before you've got into the, you know, technologically, can we do this? Do we have the people that can, can do this? Is our customer actually capable of receiving what we built at the end of it and so on? There's all sorts of pitfalls all along the way. Um, so knowledge discovery process is a really good way of thinking about what we do. A little picture describe all that. Services, workflow, knowledge discovery, and thinking about what it means to do these things at scale, where you've got um, requirements on the left being managed you know, differently, separately, in a different team to where the actual uh, delivery work is being done, where you've got multiple teams working in parallel, where they have to share things like testing and deployment services, where they're dependent on infrastructure, databases, middleware, whatever, whatever, whatever other services that they're dependent on. I'm describing software development here, obviously. Um, I spent a lot, large part of my career as a development manager in an investment bank. You know, I, 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 you know this, is, this is normal for me. Um, I don't know if it's, it's normal for you. Um, but we need to be able to think about how we can improve, uh, improve things at these kinds of scale. And I found a, a question that's really helpful for doing this, uh, for, for un unlocking flow at scale. How soon will we know that we have met a customer need? If you're the guy down there, how long is it going to take before the work that you do makes a difference to the customer over here? And often, they're actually, you go into a typical organisation, they can't actually answer that question. And that's actually quite, quite scary when you think about it. You know, where's the meaning in the work when you've no idea what impact it's having on anybody? Um, so that is quite a catalyzing question, I think. Um, and another good question, and perhaps if, you know, if, if, if that's just boggling your mind already, you know, just a simple question, how will we know? Um, I had an experience when um, I was an IT director of a, a small company uh, working out in Hungary. And I got very frustrated over the fact that we were forever developing features that ended up not being used. And that's a very, very common story, I know. And I thought, um, Right, I'm going to address this bad customer behaviour. When we've delivered a piece of work, we're going to sit down with the customer, we're going to have a conversation. They, they're going to know that this conversation is going to happen, and we are going to get to a point where the customer confirms that they're getting value out of the thing that we've just delivered. Not just that it was what was asked for, but they were, they were already getting value out of it. Cut a long story short, this had an amazing effect on our whole process. You know, the implementation steps just before delivery were absolutely nailed. We made sure we had all the static data in place and all those other things you have to do to make things work. Testing was done with the customer. Development was done with the customer looking over our shoulder. Right back to you know, prioritization at the beginning. No one wants to start a piece of work now that's going to end in an embarrassing conversation. Um, I was blaming the customer for bad behavior. You know, what I came to learn, you know, and, and, it, and it, this was you know, a humbling experience to go through, is that we just didn't have good enough collaboration between the team and the customer. And, you know, and I have to, as an IT director, I have to take responsibility for that. <coughs> so a couple of really powerful questions. And those questions, um, in terms of values, they speak both to customer focus and to flow. Who are we doing the work for? Um, how long is it going to take? How, what, how, how many surprises are we going to have along the way? Is the result going to meet needs? All those, all those kind of things. I mentioned leadership as well as a way of uh, you know, getting us out of ourselves, getting teams out of themselves. And I've got two models for you I just want to share. Um, the first is due to Morton Hansen, who wrote a really good book on uh, collaboration and leadership. And it's this model called T-shaped leadership. And if you're in a position of leadership, his recommendation is that you really focus on nurturing collaboration within your teams. And then you also look to get disciplined collaboration you know, across as well. And it doesn't mean everyone has to talk to everyone all the time. That doesn't scale very well. But you need to make sure that the right conversations are happening, using that as a problem-busting tool. That's T-shaped leadership. Another good model is triads. 
Um, and this works really well in communities as well as, as, well as in organisations. And when a triad is just three people committed to the relationship between the other two. And it starts with an introduction. Um, I gave this talk um, a week ago in London, and the night before in the pub, it turned out the two people I highly respect, I've corresponded with for years, I trust their opinion, I share my work with them, one of them is reviewing my book, um, and it turned out they'd never met each other. They'd hard, they were barely aware of each other's existence. You know, I introduced them, and the very next day, one of them, Greg, comes in with some printed papers. He, 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 was, he was able to commute from home to the conference. He wasn't travelling in. He'd printed some papers for the other guy, Patrick, to read. Um, I think this is extraordinary. That, so, you know, out of one introduction, two people are already um, sharing, sharing work, sh sharing knowledge, and, and, show on, and so on. That's within the community. Now, if that kind of thing is going on in your organisation as well, that, that, you know, that can be powerful. Um, so the book Tribal Leadership is where... Is, 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 um, where um, I learned a lot, a lot of this stuff. There are some um, good examples outside of corporate life. Um, in the church, um, prayer triplets. I don't know if any of you have heard of, heard of those. I mean, my wife is in a, in a prayer triplet. That's a, that's a triad. Um, the KGB, also, <laughs> just make one extreme to the other. So <laughs> the church, from the church to the KGB, you know, they, they're, they're well known as using the triad as the way of um, supporting each other, I suppose, for watching each other as well, perhaps. I don't know. So another way of encouraging leadership and collaboration at scale. And in Kanban, if you remember back to the, the principle, encourage lead acts of leadership at every level in the organisation. It's not a top-down thing. You know, it's, as much as it's top-down, it's bottom-up and middle-out and all those, all those other things. And you can see some example of that in the, in the front cover of the Kanban book. Um, I'm stuck, I'm too busy, I'm idle, let's do something about it. Well, depending on your context, I won't spend time on this, we can spend many minutes on just on this one picture, but um, depending on, on the context, there can be four acts of leadership in that simple exchange. Um, just to give you one example, um, if you're working in an investment bank in 2009, as I was, do you want to put your hand up and say, I'm idle? <laughs> So this is in the middle of the credit crunch. Um, you know, that's not, you know, to say that, but to say it constructively, to say the process is broken, my part of the process is starved because of some, some problem upstream. You know, that, that, that's, that can be an act of leadership. Um, I'm too busy can actually be a boast uh, rather than an act of leadership, but there are times when, again, saying this isn't right, we need to change the way that we're working so that the workload is spread in a way that allows us all to be productive, that again can be an act of leadership. So leadership at every level. So service orientation, customer focus, flow and leadership, getting us out of ourselves, thinking about the end to end, um, which is a, a, you know, a slightly old um, cliche, but thinking about the needs that we're need to, meeting and using that to, to catalyse improvements in our organisations. And the last one, the slightly oddly named um, survivability, um, it's actually quite aptly named, as well as meaning that they all start with the letter S. Um, understanding, agreement and respect. And as I've been saying in talks for quite a few years, how would you expect to succeed without those? I mean, if we're in the business of change and of leading, you know, how would you expect to succeed without understanding, agreement and respect? Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time defending respect. I mean, that for me is, is, is a given. Um, I'm not saying it has to be for you, um, but it is for me, and I'm not going to bother um, defending it. We'll spend a bit more time on understanding and agreement. Um, so in, in my book, I have this line, and I use it multiple times. Can man is the humane, start with what you do now, approach to change. Um, so I hope you've seen some humanity in the stuff that I've presented already, in terms of the, the names of the values, what they mean, um, and you can read, you know, that this humane stuff into the principles and practices as well, if you go back to, to the detail. As I said, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Uh, I'm going to take that, that as given. Um, so this strange line, the start with what you do now approach to change. Um, we'll get to exactly what I mean by that in a moment. But first, um, going back to Joshua Kerieski's keynote yesterday, who was here for, uh, for Joshua yesterday? So about, about half of you. He was talking about safety. He, 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 I mean, it's really worth seeing the video when you get the chance if you, if you didn't see it. I mean, Joshua's doing some amazing stuff about safety. He's using the analogy of Alcoa, which made um, you know, zero accidents its target. 
and that being a transformative act of leadership at Alcoa, and applying that same model to software development and thinking about all these unsafe and unpleasant and hazardous things that are in our software development environments. So I'm thinking about change. And I have three, identified three patterns of unsafe change, bravado, complacency, and tampering. Um, so bravado um, I got from Jim Collins, good to great. Um, and that's when you, you, you try and do change that's actually beyond the capability of your organization to absorb. And again, if you worked in an investment bank in the 2000s, in the first decade of the, two, of the, two, of, of the century, you certainly understand what bravado looks like. Um, Complacency, that was a Russell Ackoff word if you're into your authors. Um, you know, the sin of inaction for him was the worst management sin of them all. You know, just um, not, you know, not managing with your eyes open, not, not understanding that you're about to be overtaken by the competition or be destroyed from the inside of your organisation or whatever it might be. And tampering, a favourite word of another favourite author of ours, um, Deming. Um, he used it in a particular sense of, you know, always tweaking the dials. Uh, to try and get the get the outcome that you want, and and rather than it improving outcomes, it actually making your out, outcomes um, less predictable. I use it in a management sense as well, in uh, in our kind of um, corporate life. You know, when a, when a manager says, you know, we must never let this happen again, we've got to do something about it, and for the sake of something that was just mildly embarrassing to the manager, um, you know, we now have an extra burden of process. And you keep doing this and keep doing this and you keep doing this and then you wonder why organizations just sagging under the weight of, of all this process you know this is this isn't maturity this is uh, sclerosis you know it's um it's a very unhealthy thing so bravado complacency and tampering are too fast too slow too random this j curve um i want to spend a lot of time on this and many of you have seen the j curve stuff before but this is the simple idea that things get worse before they get better um, it's not even guaranteed that they're going to get better, but you can expect when you introduce a change for it to get worse. So bravado is about introducing a change that the organisation can't sustain, it's unsafe, the pain's going to be too great, or the organisation doesn't have the patience for a change that's going to take as long as it will to, to actually realize, be realised. So we talk about small j's iterated, um, you know, change built on change built on change, each change being safe. Um, I don't want to give the, the impression that every change has to be teeny tiny. It just needs to be safe. And you know, as, 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 as I said before, complacency is something to be very wary of. If we're not moving fast enough, that can be just as big a problem as moving, moving too quickly. Um, and if we keep changing, keep changing, keep changing, we learn to get good at it. We're building a capability for change. Um, talk to Klaus over here. You know, he's, he's, at the moment, I'm just about to read the English translation of his German book. He's been working really hard on this capability for, for change stuff. Um, so he's worth talking to if you're interested in some of the skills of things like, uh, I've talked about agreement as a skill. Um, how do you manage change in your organisation? Build coalitions for change, these kind of things. Klaus is the guy to talk to about, about that stuff. Um, Understanding, this is where we get to the real nitty gritty, you'll start with what you do now. Um, and I've expanded it here. Start with what you do now, understanding the purpose of the system, how it serves and frustrates the customer, how it works and fails to work for those inside the system, and how to change it safe, safely. That's the safety thing again. Those first few, or the middle two, how it serves and frustrates the customer, how it works and fails to work for those inside the system. Remember Beate just now saying, you know, Make sure you've got some dissatisfaction. <laughs> You're not going to change anything otherwise. And in fact, this is actually really, I think, the heart of the Kanban method. Um, keeping the need for change never far from the surface. Um, and that's understanding, that's about all the stuff I just mentioned, together with transparency. That's part of what the board is doing. Smart board design is putting the impact of problems and the suspected root causes for problems, making them visible so that we're motivated to change them. And then, you know, as leaders, and that doesn't just mean managers, it can mean anyone who, who wants to have, um, you know, who wants to act as a leader. Um, maintaining the corporate commitment to doing this stuff and the personal disciplines to, you know, to manage change with understanding, agreement and respect. So that's survivability. Um, you know, it's actually, it's not about just hunkering down, protecting ourselves. It's about uh, building adaptability, resilience and so on into the organisation 
respecting people for their ability to bring that about um, and, and harnessing, harnessing their creative abilities and so on. So it really helps to gather in some of the stuff we talked about right at the beginning, you know, the, the transparency, the collaboration and, and so on. Customer focus as well, you know, we can't talk, if we're talking about um, you know, those, those J curves, you know, we're talking about fitness, getting more fit as an organisation. You can't talk about fitness without actually understanding what you're here for, you know, what your purpose is. And that's true at team level, individual level, at, but, at, but at corporate level as well. And the more senior the commitment you can make to these things, then, uh, then the easier it's going to be. I had it easy in, in many ways compared with some of you. I was the IT director. I could come in and say, right, this is how we're going to do it. Um, but I did that, I hope, in a respectful way. Um, anyway, I'm nearly done. I just want to mention um, I, I'm writing a book. It's about 90% complete. The first three chapters um, are available for um, download, uh, completely free. You don't have to register or anything. Um, in your conference bags, there's a flyer um, with this as well, if you um, blitz this. Um, so the first three chapters, they're in the chapters, the first nine chapters are in the order of the values as I presented them just now. Um, so the first three chapters will be transparency, balance, and collaboration. Uh, you'll see a little introduction as well and a little reflection at the end as well. Um, I'm a few weeks away from finishing. I'm in, uh, in the middle of um, the technical review stage. Still, some di still one chapter to write and some diagrams to draw, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty nearly there. Um, do download that. Do send me some feedback. Um, I'm, my Twitter handle's at the bottom here, Ask Blake on Twitter. Um, I, I can't remember if I put my email address at the end, but I'm, it's at the front of the presentation, Mike at DJA djaa.com will, will find me and I'd love to have some feedback. So Kanban's not so hidden agendas. They were uh, just uh, on Twitter this morning with Marcus Andrzak, a friend of mine from Germany. Hiding, these, this stuff is hiding in plain sight. All, everything I've described to you, I've abstracted from the principles and practices of the method. Uh, working with David, we've organized them a bit into the agendas. Um, I hope the agendas resonate with you as the values do, but you can create an agenda of your own. Choose three values that really work for you and think about what those together mean. Can you give them a name? Can you sell it into your organisation and so on? That's me done. Cameras not so hidden agendas. Thank you very much. Oh, well, I think we have, how much time for questions do we have? One and a half minutes for questions. So a couple of questions, that's very precise. We have none. Well, we had a couple through. through uh, obviously, you got them off your chest in the middle of the presentation, which is fine. Well, thank you very much for listening. Uh, Eric is up next. Um, he has a remarkable sustainability story. Um, I don't want to spoil the surprise by saying anything more than that. Um, more on sustainability from Russell. Um, a great story on um, the um, service orientation, delivery, scale, all those things uh, from Yuval and his co colleagues at Amdoctor. See them in the room. Um, and I, I brought someone from outside the Kanban community for the last talk of the track. Um, Froda Odegaard is going to talk about leadership. Um, uh, Lean contains a lot of really good models for leadership um, that, that certainly have inspired me. And uh, Froda is going to talk about some of those later on. Thank you very much. Thank you.